Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may the grace of Christ Jesus dwell within your hearts and in your lives in all you say and do. Amen. Has anyone ever told you, I can read you like a book? I know that I have been told this on many occasions, that I am very transparent. I'm not very good at misleading others. I'm not very good at hiding it from others if I'm angry or upset. As you know, if you've ever been told, I can read you like a book. People can know or expect how you're going to react. They have an idea of how you're going to respond. Now, we know this is not foolproof. I can read you like a book. But how amazing would it be if it was? If we could really read someone's behaviors, their actions like a book. If we could really read them as though we knew we were in their mind. Seems like it would make life easier, doesn't it? I know one of the things I really enjoy about reading is that in books, there's no screen, there's no actors, and so an author has to really describe what's going through the mind of the person. He has to or she has to help us to understand what they're thinking and what their motives are, what their, where their heart is. Ken Casey, he wrote a book that probably many of you are familiar with, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but he also wrote other books as well. And one of my favorite books is Sometimes a Great Notion, which he wrote a couple years later. But in both those books, one of the reasons I like them is Ken Casey does a neat job of, exp of, of bringing us into the mind and the hearts of people. It's probably been a while, but if you ever read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, do you remember Nurse Ratchet? Yeah, I, I know that you do because he did a, such a good job of making you just despise her and dislike her because you could never imagine being like her, behaving like her, thinking like her, and acting like her. Now imagine if we could really read a, a person's character like that. If we could really look into their hearts and know exactly what they're thinking and what their motives are. It'd make life easier, right? Probably not. We're a people that have a tendency to judge others. We are people who tend to judge regardless of what a person's motives are, where a person's heart is. Maybe in a moment of holiness we might say to ourselves, well, if I knew their motives I'd be more compassionate and caring. I don't think so. Nor does Scripture suggest that either. We are people who look at the outward appearance of uh, and behaviors of others. Just think about it for a minute. Someone cuts you off in traffic. You might say, you might be frustrated at them, and you might think to yourself, or you might even announce it to their car, or telling, telling the other, other people riding with you how this person should drive. Now, what if you found out that that person was driving their wife to the hospital and her water had already broken? Well, your heart might be a little more compassionate, but you'd still be frustrated that they cut you off. You might still be angry at them. Or, for instance, some of you had parents or in-laws who, well, they, they like to take, take account for what you did in your marriage and your relationship. They, help, they like to help guide you in your finances. Now, they meant well. Their experience was leading them, but it can cause animosity, sometimes resentment. Or if the shoe's on the other foot, Many of you are parents and grandparents. How often have you offered, with the best of intentions, your experience to your children or grandchildren and been ignored? Now, they might not have been ignoring you because they didn't appreciate it. Probably not. But maybe they had another, another idea in mind already. But it's hard for us, isn't it? It's hard for us, even knowing the motives of someone else, not to judge their behaviors and their actions. It seems like it's wired into us. Not by God, but by our sinful human nature. So often, by our sinful human nature, we look and, and, we, and we judge before we get to know someone, before we get a moment to talk to them. We look and judge, and by what they say or do, we've already passed our judgment. And imagine if we could read their motives. How much worse that would be. Jesus commands us in Luke chapter 10, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and Love your neighbor as yourself. Love our neighbors as ourselves. Seems like it should be an easy thing to do. To face one another with love and mercy and compassion. Seems like it should not be a, a difficult task for us as Christian people. And yet, how, how hard is it for us to face one another with love and not with judgment? To face one another with mercy and not condescension? So often in our lives, we assume the worst. We struggle to love one another. In our epistle, Paul talks a little bit more about what loving one another is. If you go to the very end of our epistle lesson today from Ephesians 4, he writes, 
Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave you. We've been called to be people who share God's love, to forgive and to share His grace and mercy. And how hard a task that is for us to do. Because Paul doesn't just talk about the way we treat one another, but Paul talks about the way we speak to one another. He talks about the way we think about one another. Notice what he was, talk- he was talking about emotions there. He was talking about the way you think about your fellow man or your fellow woman. He was talking about the way that you treat them when no one else is looking. And loving our neighbor is a pretty tall order. Facing one another is hard. God calls us to love as he first loved us. But so often that love fails. And I wonder where that comes from. I wonder if our love grows weak and weary because of the world we live in or the life we live, or is that our reason and excuse? I wonder if sometimes that our failure to love, our failure to be gracious to others, comes from ingratitude. Ingratitude at, towards what God has done for us. Now, I don't think any of you would ever say that. I don't think any of you would ever suggest that you're ungrateful for what God has done, but how do we show that gratefulness in our actions, in the words, in our deeds? How do we show others that we're grateful for what God has done for us? So often, that ingratitude really seems to appear there. Our love grows thin with our spouses when he or she is not Mr. or Mrs. Right as they were when we dated them. Our love grows thin with our our friends when they repeat the same story for the 27th time and we know the ending already. Our love grows thin for our grandkids when they, they don't use the generosity that we've shown them wisely as we've suggested. Our love grows thin for others when, when, when others don't treat us the way we are or the way we expect them to. See, we live in a world that does not have fine lines. It doesn't have clean edges. We're not exactly the same, and we are different people. And those differences sometimes become barriers. Those differences sometimes become walls. And sometimes we are those who build them up because someone is different than us, because they talk different or seem different, because they don't treat us how we think they should. Truth is, so often our love fails because we don't reflect God's love in our lives. We don't reflect God's love for us, His mercy and compassion for us. When we think about it, we're those books that already have ripped pages, coffee stains throughout. We're those books that if someone were to open up even to page one or two, they'd have to cast it aside in no time because page one or two already has such sordid details that it makes them sick. If someone opened up the book of your life, what would they read? What tears would they see? What smudges in the ink would they see? No, the books of our lives Really, all that we deserve is for them to be tossed into the garbage and burned. And they said, God, he he grabs those books out of the garbage. He grabs those books out of the garbage and he dusts them off. And and he's already read every sort of detail on every page of those books. He's already flipped through and he's read the ending already. And he looks at it and he says, this one, it's my favorite one. He looks at each of you and he says, this one, that's my favorite one. You're his favorite one. He read those sordid details. He looked past those scratches and those tears and those, those stains. He didn't ignore them. He didn't put, throw white out on the page and just pretend they weren't there. No, there was a cost for it. Instead of us being those tossed into the garbage and, and burned, he allowed his son to be the one treated like garbage to be mocked, to be scorned, to be spat upon, to be dragged through the streets, to be hung on a cross, and finally to experience that burning, that hell for us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me were the words of Christ Jesus as he experienced the true hell that we will never experience, as he experienced the true hell that none of God's children will ever experience. Jesus did for us. 
And instead, God looks at us as pristine copies of the book. Instead, he looks at us as his very own because we are his new creation, who he has washed and made clean in our holy baptism. We are his new creation, who he has saved from death, and he has recovered from the fires of hell so that we could be his people, so that we could be his favorite ones. And he did this all out of his gracious love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a reason that we remember that verse. There's a reason that we have that verse memorized. It's because we do know that our God chose us. Our God saved us. Our God picked us and made us worthy. He clothed us with His very own righteousness. On our own, we could not put on that cloak of righteousness. We are caught up in that slander and in that malice. We are caught up in that bitterness and that rage. But with God our Savior, we can know compassion and we can know mercy. We can know love and we can know comfort. And that is what God has called us to do. To face one another with that compassion and with that mercy as His very own children. Not by ourselves, but with His Holy Spirit. Because as we turn the pages of our life, as we turn page after page, He turns them with us. His Holy Spirit is there with us. As we face the difficult trials of our lives, the people who don't deserve our love, He's there right alongside us to remind us of how undeserving we are and yet how gracious He was. See, there's going to be a lot of people who we're going to look at and we're going to say, they're mean, they're nasty, they're rude. They don't deserve my love. They don't deserve well, any kind, anyone's love. And those are the ones God sends us to, to share our love. Those are the ones that God has sent us to face, to share His compassion, His forgiveness, His mercy. He didn't send us just to those who have already been saved, but to send, He has sent us to those, those who have been cast out, those who have been forgotten, those who have been left. And He has promised He's going with us. He has promised He's going with us each and every step of the way. And this is a difficult thing. Because sometimes you know that even in your family relationships, it's hard to love those who you, are, who you live with, who you raised. But God gives you that strength and that compassion. Sometimes it's difficult because people will do things that are downright evil, things that are downright ugly. And in those times, we need to come to our Lord and we need to come to Him in prayer. On Wednesday night, I talked to, talked to you about forgiveness. And that's just the starting point. Forgiveness is where we begin, but that is not where we stop. Forgiveness is not the only thing we need to do to mend those relationships and to rebuild those relationships with others. It takes humbling ourselves and coming to those who, we, who, those who we have our fights with, our arguments with, our differences with, and facing them one-on-one, -on -one, reconciling with them, letting them share their side, sharing our side, but bathing it in God's prayer. James reminds us in James chapter 5, the prayers of a righteous man or woman are powerful and effective. The prayers, of, the prayers that we lift up before God, they are not empty prayers. Those prayers that we lift up to God are not just forgotten prayers, but those prayers have power in themselves. And when we want, need to mend a relationship with someone else, when we need to restore a, someone, a relationship with another, when we need to face someone else, it is only with prayer and the power of the Spirit that we can do so. It is only by the Spirit working in our hearts. It is only by those prayers that we lift up that God might give us the strength and, and the, excuse me, that He might give us the strength and the healing that we need. Because it is only through God's might that we can be healed. Now I know that all of us struggle to face one another. I know that we all struggle with judgment. I know that when we look at people that, that we have a tendency to decide who they're going to be before we talk to them. But I encourage you as you turn the pages of your life that you would turn those people over to the Lord in prayer. That if there's someone that you, that you, that you look at and you have a t distaste in your mouth, if there's someone who you look at and, and you just can't, or you can't even bear to look at them, that you turn that over to the Lord. And that as, he, as you turn the pages of your life, as you go through your life, that, they might, that you might pray for God's compassion, that you might pray for God's peace. They pray that God will lead you to forgive them, that you, might pray, that you might pray that He might lead you to reconcile with them. And I do pray 
that the pages of your life would be filled with the love and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, all too often it is hard to face one another. It's hard to face one another because we are sinners and we are broken people. We are people who have failed to keep your law and failed to keep your commands and we have certainly hurt and harmed others. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would, in your mercy, continue to forgive us. Continue to look at us and offer us that forgiveness because of your precious death on the cross. Lead us to love others as you have first loved us. Lead us to remember your command that greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. May we be willing to lay down our lives, not only for those who are close friends, but for those who you have put in our lives, those who you have commanded us to show love to. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would lead us each and every step of our lives, that as we go through our lives, that our lives might bring honor to you, that if there, are, if there is hate and if there is anguish, that we might turn those over to you in your mercy. Lord, we do pray that you would prepare us for that one day. For because you have died on the cross, because you have spared us from the fires of hell, we know that we will one day be with you forever. Prepare us for that day, leading our lives and leading our ways, that we may know the peace and hope of everlasting life. This we pray in your holy name, O Christ Jesus. Amen.